All right, I think we're going to go and get started. So it's my pleasure to have uh, here today uh, Dr. Katrina Cook. Uh, she's currently a senior scientist at the in-stream fisheries research, but she's been in the fisheries research world for quite a while. She got her master's degree from Carleton University, uh, working on stress-related physiology. Uh, then she took a position at the Pacific Northwest National Lab uh, for a couple of years after that, and uh, and in late 2018, she defended her PhD at the University of British Columbia in the Forestry and Conservation Department. And, and during that time, she did, and she's still publishing uh, really relevant work on, on bycatch-related uh, research uh, that is very applicable to the kind of research that we're doing here at, uh, at IPHC. So thanks very much, uh, Katrina, and uh, we'll look forward to your talk. All right, um, thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction um, and for listening in. As you mentioned, I'm with Instream Fisheries Research that's in Squamish, British Columbia. So that's just about 45 minutes north of Vancouver on the way to Whistler. Um, but today I'm presenting work that I did my PhD on at UBC. And my PhD, I worked with salmon. And um, the goal was to understand rates of post-release mortality, under some, understand some of the factors associated with mortality, and then work with the fishing community to try to reduce mortality through changing handling and by exploring the social side of the fishery. So I have lots of people to thank here. It was a huge collaborative effort. Um, I want to point out my co-authors there. Uh, we had funding from mostly NSERC, but also from the Pacific Salmon Commission, from the Canadian fishing company, Canfisco, um, from the Ocean Tracking Network. And I also want to acknowledge the Gitgat and Nishka First Nations who gave us the permission to conduct, conduct this research on their traditional territories. And I need to thank the fishing community as well. It's not uh, easy to have a scientist on board, as I'm sure a lot of you are well aware. And they were very welcoming and accommodating. And this work wouldn't have been able to be completed without their support. So I'm really appreciative of all the skippers that brought me on board their boats. So just to go through a bit of an outline here of what I plan to talk about today. I'll introduce my study system because this was working with um, salmon fisheries, which some of you may not be as familiar with. I'll spend some time overviewing my general methods. For results, I'll focus on post-release mortality, factors associated with mortality, and then go into some of my handling results. And then a big portion of this work is just understanding if it's even relevant. We come up with these recommendations, but what does the fishing community even think of this? And is, are these recommendations practical? And then I'll scale this up and talk about how it can be applied to other systems, for example, maybe halibut fisheries. So Pacific salmon purse stain fisheries, they're fairly selective in that very few other species are captured but they can't selectively harvest by um, species or population. So you still have a bycatch problem and non-target populations or species are released. And I primarily worked with the Persane fishery um, with this research and they especially capture a broad geographic aggregate of um, populations and species. And to understand why this occurs and why it's a problem takes a bit of understanding of Pacific salmon life history. This is all really basic. I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but Pacific salmon are anadromous and semiparous. So their life begins in freshwater and as juveniles, they migrate to the ocean um, where they'll feed and freshwater and ocean residency times are variable. But what all populations share in common is that they return to their, spawn, their home streams or natal streams to spawn and die. Um, so, where this is relevant in terms of a bycatch context is that each population is uniquely adapted to the specific requirements of their migration and rearing area. So a fishery capturing multiple populations will get populations of variable abundances, um, each with unique population specific characteristics and each that will respond to stress differently. And to look at this geographically and in the context of commercial fisheries, here's a map of BC, there's Vancouver Island. I made this map obviously in Vancouver, the blue dots showing me in Vancouver. Um, and you can see Washington and Alaska there. And what I've drawn on here is just a really coarse 
oversimplification of the major, major salmon bearing rivers in BC, the Fraser on the bottom and the Nass and the Skeena in the north. And as Pacific salmon return from their ocean feeding grounds to these natal uh, rivers and their tributaries and other coastal systems to spawn, they're encountered by several different types of fisheries. And I worked with Persane fisheries, so here's some Persanes. And my research was working on a few different fisheries. I worked with the fishery that released chum salmon in area three and area six, which I've circled here on the map and with coho salmon in area 20, which is just off the west coast of Vancouver Island. And a critical challenge of mixed population fisheries like these um, is how can you sustainably harvest abundant populations while avoiding those populations of conservation concern when you're collecting, um, capturing such a mix of populations. And DFO, which is the Canadian Federal Fisheries Agency, um, they employ a mandatory release as a conservation measure. So any um, non-target species or species of conservation concern is released. However, problem with this is that mortality estimates of these released fish are, are unknown or they're a little vague. So I, part of my work was to understand the mortality of released fish. And one aspect of this was to measure responses to capture immediately. And I did this by collecting blood samples as soon as the fish was brought on board. That's me taking a blood sample, I think, in a coho. And with blood sampling, you can look at chemical responses to stress and exhaustion by looking at cortisol and lactate concentrations. You can look at metabolic or osmotic imbalances. But physiological predictor uh, measurements are often poor predictors of success. They're quite temporally variable, and we've been talking a lot about this this morning. Um, and especially in the context of a fishery capture scenario where you don't necessarily know when that fish first perceived the stress, when it was encounter first encountered the gear. So there's this temporal aspect that you can't control for and you see a lot of variability. So indices of animal condition are potentially better predictors of success than blood physiology. And they can um, elucidate stressor severity and survival probability. And I used two of these indices. The first was reflex impairment or vitality or ramp. It's given a few different names. I tend to use impairment. And it evaluates responses to some kind of induced stimuli. So is a reflex there or not? And the score is sometimes presented as a proportion of the numbers of reflexes impaired or as an absolute value of the number of reflexes impaired, in which I use really depends on the type of analysis that you're doing. And this is really intuitive. It really just tells you how lethargic is the fish. So on the left here, um, my field assistant, Christine, who has excellent uh, fish handling skills, that fish is doing everything it can to get out of the trough. It's not impaired. So we wouldn't do a reflex impairment test on this fish. We would assume it's zero. But on the other side, you can see that fish obviously has some reflexes impaired. So in fish that aren't appropriately responding to stimuli, you find where on that spectrum it lies and in terms of the number of reflexes impaired. The other index I looked at was injury. Um, and for injury, I collected several different injury observations, scale loss, skin loss, whether it had wounds, how severe the wound was, um, any kind of fin fray. And then I scaled all these observations to equally weight them and add them together. So this provides a semi-quantitative observation-based index that can be used as either a continuous or a categorical measure, depending on how many injury observations you record. And then the other aspect of the response is how it changes over time, not just the immediate response, but what happens after you release the fish. And I got at this by doing holding studies and conducting repeated sampling um, of blood physiology or of the impairment and injury indices. And just a note on these holding studies, um, some of the fisheries I worked with are in very remote areas where it's exceptionally logistically challenging to do any work. And I'm sure with halibut fisheries, you can relate to this as well. So we actually camped out on this dock. So we would go out with the, in the fisheries when the boats would be there and then transport chum to this dock. And we lived out on the dock for the month and watched over these chum. Um, and it's spectacularly beautiful. You know, we were visited by this humpback every day and um, it's amazing, but it comes with some challenges. And holding studies are the only way to monitor condition over time, but there's not just these logistical challenges, but they also have clear limitations. You're monitoring these fish in a predator-free environment, whereas predation is a big aspect of mortality that we really aren't very good at quantifying. 
There's confinement stress, especially for migrating salmon that want to be on the move, and here we have them in a pen. And then there's um, just the stress of holding as well. So these are all things you have to consider when doing these holding studies. And then in some cases, I was actually able to measure absolute fate and doing this through telemetry. Pacific salmon are a great model for this because they have what we call directed migration. So we know where they're going, especially if you have stock ID. And then you can very conveniently just put receivers along their migration pathway and look at fate to different detection points. And this is an acoustically tagged coho salmon. Often um, with transmitters in adult salmon, you can just gastrically tag them because they've stopped feeding. But because coho, we captured them earlier in their marine migration, they were still feeding at the time. So we externally affixed the transmitters here. So just to get some, into some results here. So this is a telemetry study. Is there a pointer here? Hmm. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's little. Okay, I'm, that's a lot of work. I might not bother. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, so here's the map of the study system. This is the Olympic Peninsula here, BC and Vancouver Island. All the asterisks represent release locations and all of the points are um, receivers, including this line spanning the Juan de Fuca. And then the dotted lines represent the expected migration pathways of the different populations with the width of the line representing the, the proportion of the population expected to take that route. Um, so in terms of survival, it was about 65% from release to first detection, and this is including all populations, or all populations except these few that went to the offshore. San Juan Islands um, survival drops to about 50%, and then to the Fraser River, um, we can see really quite low survival of 30% for Fraser River fish. And that took about two weeks. So these overall low survival to the Fraser River is quite concerning. And so we, there were a few other fisheries operating in this area. We ran an experimental fishery in a year when the fishery was closed. So that we know most of this mortality is either due to natural causes or the fishery capture itself that we did. And this was a sample size of about 220 fish. But then when you digest this down and look at mortality among the different populations, you see that it's quite population specific. So those first estimates I showed you were taking all populations together. But if you look at it by population grouping, here's cumulative survival um, and distance from release. Looking at just the Fraser River population grouping, so low, lower Fraser River fish had 14% survival compared to the interior Fraser River fish at 48% survival. So this population level effect was really strong in this study. And these mortality estimates are really important. It's what DFO uses to manage the fishery. They have a total expected allowable harm um, for each species in each fishery. And once that, that percentage has been met, given the mortality estimate for bycatch, the fishery that's encountering these species is closed. Um, so it's really important to have accurate estimates and considering different population level effects. But I was really interested in what factors are associated with mortality. Why are we see, seeing this mortality? What is the mechanism? And in the coho telemetry study, injury and impairment were the strongest predictors of survival. Um, and in my modeling, injury especially came out as important. And I recorded all these different injury observations and scale loss consistently came out as the most important predictor of success in the study. And here are my scale loss classifications. I have them classified as little to none in the red bars, moderate or severe in the green bars. And there are some obvious population specific differences here. For example, Puget Soundfish were the only ones that had severe scale loss, and I'm not really sure why that is. But if you look at the classifications by fate, with zero being the fish that didn't make it to the first line of detection, and one being the fish that did make it to the first line of detection, you can see there's consistently among all the populations, higher category, um, a greater proportion of fish in the moderate and severe classification among the fish that didn't make it to the first line of detection. So fish with scale loss are less likely to survive capture and release. <clears throat> 
And then I took this farther and I wanted to understand what the mechanism of this is. Why are fish with scale loss not making it? So I used blood physiology to determine mechanisms. Um, and I had four scale loss categories. This is from a holding study, so we saw a wider range of scale loss. And I looked at the physiological parameters of cortisol, glucose, lactate, um, potassium, sodium chloride, and osmolality, but sodium chloride and osmolality were so correlated that I had to digest these down using a factor analysis. So the resulting was an extracted component that I called the um, plasma ion score. And this is a synthetic variable that represents the action of these three parameters. And then I conducted a linear discriminant analysis. And this essentially tells me if my visual classifications of scale loss are actually meaningful in terms of the collected physiological parameters. And with an LDA, what you get is distributions of LDA1, which has the majority of the proportion of variance. And you can see here just with the distributions that there is a very large divergence among the different injury categories. So this tells me that considering all these physiological parameters, there is separation, there is, these are meaningful classifications. And this is just immediate responses, but if you look at how these physiological parameters change over time, it's quite informative in terms of mechanisms. So here we have um, severely injured fish with the dotted line, and this is the plasma ion score, sorry, and different sampling time periods. Moderately injured fish in the dashed line, minor is the solid black line, and then uninjured fish are represented here by the solid gray line. And you can see that plasma ion scores are higher initially, but then stay high in injured fish and actually increase over time in moderately injured fish. So with these holding studies, you're seeing a failure to recover sodium chloride and osmolality concentrations. Looking at lactate, it differs initially, so higher lactate buildup in more injured fish, but it recovers in, by the same degree by the first sampling point. Cortisol is very interesting. It was non-significant because there is so much variation in cortisol data, but you do see this increase over time in injured fish and a pretty stable um, response in uninjured fish. So looking at the ion concentrations, you may see that the fail this mortality among fish with scale loss could be a failure to maintain osmoregulatory control due to just impairment of barrier function or not being able to regulate ions across the, um, the barrier. But it could just be a byproduct of stress, and that could just be confinement stress. And we can't disentangle these two factors, unfortunately, with holding studies. So I also did a linear discriminant analysis using the same metrics of physiology, but among different impairment categories. And impairment is just the number of reflexes impaired. Um, for consistency in this analysis, I called the minor, moderate, severe again. And you can see here with this LDA that there isn't much differentiation between um, the minor and moderate category. So that means that the classification of minor and moderate are essentially the same in terms of the measured physiological parameters. And that means that I can group them together for subsequent analyses and have a bit more power that way as well. So looking at how these change over time, um, sorry there's no legend here, but the dotted lines are severely injured fish, the dashed line is minor and moderate, and the solid line is uninjured fish. You see initial differences in plasma ion scores, um, but no real consistent differences over time. And lactate, large differences initially, but then they all recover as they did with the injury classifications. So what this tells me is that when you're looking at injury and impairment in, a, in, an, in fish captured in a fishery, injury is likely associated with the latent mortality. So you're seeing these delayed effects of loss of osmoregulatory control or delayed effects of stress where impairment is more associated with immediate mortality. So immediately upon release, the fish are lethargic, they have compromised swimming abilities and aren't able to escape predation in the same extent as less impaired fish are. So I'm just going to get into some of my handling results now. And before I get into how we can change handling, it takes an understand of how, understanding of how fish are handled in the first place. Um, so after the, per, the net is brought out and brought back into the boat with the power skiff, um, the net's uh, pulled up on the drum here, and then the fish are all left in one bag that's brought alongside the boat. And then the brailler, essentially the smaller net, is used to scoop the fish out one brailler load at a time. And then the fish are sorted, and some boats use sorting tables, 
Other boats don't use sorting tables. And this is where they're exposed to air, obviously. And then for release, a lot of the boats that have sorting tables have voluntarily installed release chutes so they can just push the fish over the chute. Other boats um, pick them up off the deck and throw them overboard. And by experimentally modifying some of these ways of handling fish um, on board the vessel, we can determine thresholds in responses and support best, uh, suggested best practices and make recommendations of how to appropriately handle fish in these fisheries. And the two aspects I was interested in were net handling methods, so how long fish um, were held alongside of the boat and air exposure duration, so how long they were on the sorting table or on the deck after being brailed. And what I did is I measured blood physiology and also injury and impairment at different levels of these uh, stressors. So to first talk about net handling, So by collecting blood samples as soon as the fish are brought on board, we can look at thresholds. So a change in the relationship between the duration of the stressor and the physiological response. And to identify thresholds, I conducted spline regressions, which are also called hockey stick curves sometimes. So a linear regression is just one line of spline. You're looking for a breaking point, so that change. And that change is where the threshold is in that response. And here I'm looking at time and net versus blood physiology. And in this particular graph, it's glucose, which is a secondary stress indicator. So each of the ind individual dots is a fish that I collected a blood sample from after eight to 47 minutes um, pursed in the net alongside the boat. And the dotted line is the linear regression and the solid line is a spline regression, which was a significantly better fit to the data. And it shows a breaking point at 15 minutes. So you see initial increase in the response and then it plateaus. And all indicators I looked at showed the same breaking point at around 15 meter, minutes, sorry. Lactate um, was at 15 minutes and chloride, I think it was at about 14 minutes. Uh, and this is potentially indicative of when stop, fish stop fighting, when they're, um, when they're physically exhausted and their um, response kind of maxes out. So this tells us that if you complete sorting within 15 minutes, then fish will be um, released in a less physiological compromised state. Um, but blood sampling is pretty hard to do aboard a vessel. Uh, you have to spin it on board and then you have to have liquid nitrogen on board as well. So the blood samples were collected from just a few sets all within one day, really. But really, capture conditions are more dynamic than that. You have variability in set size. You have differences in how the fish are crowded. Some fishermen like to pull the net way, way up and crowd the fish. And it's called drying up the set because they think that's easier for brailing. Other fishermen leave it loose because they think that's easier for brailing. And everybody has their own way of handling this net. So to look to have a broader range of, of conditions to evaluate, I looked at impairment because it's um, it's easy, it's cheap, and it's informative, so you can do it off a wide variety of set types. The problem with impairment is that the response variable, it's categorical, it's the number of reflexes impaired, and not only is it categorical or multinomial, it's also ordinal. There's a clear order to that. So that represents or presents challenges in how it's analyzed. So to account for this, the nature of the variable, I did, I conducted proportional odds linear regression models, which are called polar models as well. And it gives you the predictive probability of being in one category of reflex impairment versus the category above it. Um, so it retains the categorical and ordinal nature of the variable while keeping it as a response variable. So I evaluated impairment as a response given catch conditions. I looked at set size, whether the set was dried up or kept loose, and also the time in the net. And the most parsimonious model included whether the fish was crowded or not and the time in the net. Set size didn't come out as being important. And here's the results of the proportional odds uh, or the polar model, I'll just call it. And each color represents a number of reflexes impaired. And you can see when fish are crowded, there's no change with time. The pr probability of having a given refl reflex impairment score stays consistent over time. But when fish are crowded, the probability of having these lower reflex impairment scores decreases in time over time, while the probability of having the higher reflex impairment scores increases over time. 
And if you look at the, that 15 minute mark where I showed the threshold in blood physiology, that's also where you see a transition between having the most common uh, category of having two, it goes from having one reflex impaired to two reflexes impaired. So impairment increases with time in the net when not crowded, but when, it's, when they're crowded, there's no effect of time. So in terms of recommendation that um, justifies or solidifies our argument to complete sorting within 15 minutes, but it also tells us if we keep the net loose, especially initially, you can reduce impairment of these released fish. So now in terms of air exposure, these, again, I did a spline regression modeling after um, various durations of air exposure on the deck, ranging from zero to 12 minutes. And here we have plasma lactate, and this is an example of where the spline regression model did not work. So here you can see a clear linear relationship, and when you fit a spline to this, it doesn't improve the model fit. Uh, and the, uh, the gray line here is just the average and standard deviation of fish that weren't exposed to any air. When you look at glucose, the spline regression model did fit the data, but it shows a continuous um, response and then a drop in plasma glucose concentrations. And it drops to very low levels. We know that under concentrations of two millimoles per liter, salmon can't really sustain life. So that it's dropping to these really low levels is really cause for concern. It shows these fish are becoming hypoglycemic and it's really at the, the limits of what they're able to survive. But interestingly, we saw really high survival. So these fish weren't held, but um, in the holding studies where I did expose fish to up to 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes of air exposure, we saw 60% survival among these fish. So this shows that chum are, are quite hardy to air exposure, which we weren't necessarily expecting. But it also tells us that the spline regression is maybe not very biologically relevant because we don't want our threshold to be at the limit of what fish can survive. We want, we want to release them before that happens. So we have evidence of severe physiological disruptions. Fish are becoming hypoglycemic after a certain level of air exposure. Um, but it's not the, a threshold isn't necessarily reflected by the spline regression. Um, so I thought maybe impairment would be a better indicator of the effects of air exposure. It's also indicative of neurological trauma, which the blood chemistry doesn't necessarily get at. And here's the results from the, the polar model with um, air exposure time and reflex impairment. And each of these curves is a predicted probability of having that reflex impairment score. And again, blue are the, the fewest number of reflexes impaired and up to red and yellow, which are the most. So if you look at... One, the most probable outcome is to have one reflex impaired. That's after one minute of air exposure, sorry. After two minutes, it switches to having two reflexes impaired being the most probable outcome. And we know from previous research that the time between two and three reflexes impaired is where you start to see a lot of mortality. So this is where you start to become a little concerned about the condition of fish being released. At four minutes, it switches to three being the most probable outcome. And if you look at six minutes where we observe fish becoming hypoglycemic, um, now three, the probable, the predicted probability of having three reflexes impaired is starting to decrease and probabilities of having these higher categories is starting to increase. So the next year, I continued investigations into air exposure with another holding study in another area. Um, the, holding, the study I was just talking about, there wasn't a fishery opening that year. Returns were much, much lower than expected. So set sizes were small and it wasn't very reflective of, of actual fishery conditions. So I repeated the next year in an area that has more consistent captures and I was able to test the effect with larger set sizes. And here just the nature of how the experiment was run. A um, little bit different experimental design where I had classifications of a range of air exposure durations, zero, one to two, two to three, and four to five minutes. And the different colors represent the number of reflexes impaired going from light to none to dark purple with six. And you can see a clear differentiation between the one and two minute category and the two and a half and three minute category where fish are having a lot more reflexes impaired after two and a half to three minutes of air exposure. So to summarize all of these recommendations, uh, the first thing I want to point out is that all of this work was done with CHUM and 
not only can thresholds be species specific, but likely population specific. We did see those very large population specific differences in mortality. We weren't able to identify these CHUM to population. This was just a, a random subset of CHUM from the central and north coast. And CHUM are also thought to be quite resilient to capture stressors, just talking to the fishing community. So the recommendations we have for CHUM probably don't apply to other species. Nonetheless, our net handling data does suggest that sorting fish prior to 15 minutes will reduce stress, and keeping the net loose will reduce impairment, especially initially. Air exposure data didn't provide such concrete recommendations, but it does suggest that after one minute, you'll see elevated impairment and fish are likely more susceptible to predation. After two minutes, is it high mortality is likely, but we weren't able to confirm this. And after six minutes, air exposure is likely um, lethal and they're unlikely to be able to recover it from it in the wild. So there are several limitations to holding studies that I really need to acknowledge um, to keep in mind while we're considering these results. First, predation is a very large and unquantified source of mortality that we don't get at by holding fish in pens. Cortisol is typically elevated upon termination of holding studies. Again, so confinement stress is a real issue. And we typically see injury to increase through holding. So these are just density plots of injury scores collected at the three different holding studies I did. And the parameters I included in the injury scoring changed over time, but what has been consistent is that from day zero to the second or third sampling period, you see an increase in injury. This could be delayed effects of capture. There is evidence that injuries will progress in the days after release, but it could just be holding effects or in, from them encountering with the netting of the pen. And this is something that we can't disentangle and it's likely a combination of both and just something we need to keep in mind when we're considering response, injury as a response variable. Nonetheless, holding studies um, do produce relative mortality estimates, and if you have appropriate controls and appropriate experimental designs, we can evaluate relative mortality, mechanisms of mortality, and compare responses to capture stressors. So despite all these limitations, there is something really informative that can come out of holding studies. So this is just summarizing my recommendations again. Um, less than two minutes of air, ideally even less than one minute, which is feasible in these fisheries, and less than 15 minutes in a loose net. And the methods that I use to come up with these recommendations are appropriate for other fisheries or any fishery that um, does release fish. So is this relevant? Um, it's a very good question that we should be asking about all the science we do. The Persane fishery in BC, it's very self-regulated. There isn't much enforcement out there. Um, it's a very small community and they kind of keep an eye on each other. But we know from any natural resources study and especially from fisheries that a support from the community is successful for, is essential for successful conservation strategies. You just can't go out and tell them to release their fish in under 15 minutes. They have to really understand why and buy into that policy and want to do it. And the, all the mortality estimates that we consider and looking at all these factors that may influence mortality, we rarely consider compliance or variability among the vessels and how fish are handled and how likely fishermen are to comply with suggested best practices. And that's a big, big thing that we need to consider. So I conducted semi-structured and anonymous interviews um, with commercial purseine skippers and crew. And um, something that's interesting about this data is uh, of all the interviews I conducted, um, the average number of years fishing was something like 48 or 47.5. That, that's average years fishing. So um, fleet's been around for a while. <laughs> So the first thing I want to get at is problem perception. Do they even perceive there to be a problem in the first place? Do they, what do they think of release mortality? So I asked, do released fish survive to spawning? And most, 70%, 6% of participants believe survival to be high. One participant said, all of them survive. That's what I think, otherwise I wouldn't do it. So then I asked, is there a need for standardized handling procedures? Um, such as these recommendations I came up with. And 64% of participants believed it would be unnecessary, ineffective, or already exists. So there clearly isn't much of a problem perception here um, in terms of needing to improve handling or improve release mortality. Um, I think the general consensus is that fish are, are surviving release. 
So then I did a bit more digging to see where the problem might lie. Um, so I asked, when making management decisions, does DFO, which is our federal fisheries agency, primarily consider industry, conservation, public opinion, or I give the option of giving a, another response? And 57% believed public opinion or other. Um, whereas conservation is a clearly stated mandate of DFO, it's all over their literature. It's that you know they're always saying they're putting conservation first, and I you know I work with a lot of people in DFO, and that it, that is their objective, and that is what they're trying to do. Um, but that's obviously not being perceived by the fishing community. Um, where they did say conservation, which was 17%, they did mention that goals are not being achieved. One participant said, I have no idea. It must be public perception. None of it makes sense. They're not made in the best interest of anybody or anything. So that paints a really negative picture of, what, of what's happening, but it really does tell us where the problem lies. There's this issue of distrust and miscommunication between the fishing community and the regulators that are, are really doing a good job at what, with the, what they have. Um, and this is something to not be avoided or just pushed under the rug. We need to pay attention to these things. So and then on a more positive note, I asked, um, so even if you think survival is high, how could you make it even higher? What is the single change that would be most effective in terms of improving survival, but also be practical and cost effective? And the most common response was infrastructural changes. Um, so some boats still sort their fish on deck. Others use a sorting table, and others have voluntarily installed these release chutes. And even those that don't use release chutes said that if they could have one on their boat, that would improve the condition of fish. One participant said, the chute on this boat works like a hot dam. They would save a lot more fish if everybody had chutes. So there, and that was a pretty um, consistent response among most of the participants. And then the other most commonly um, stated response was improved communication and feedback. Is releasing fish even working? You're doing it, meaning releasing fish, to protect the stocks, but there's no information coming back about why or if it works. And so the, sorry, so the release chute is something that's practical, it's achievable, you know, it may be $500 to install a chute on a boat, and if it's something that the fishing community endorses, that might be an appropriate solution. So just taking this a little bit into bigger picture and application to other systems, I kind of didn't talk on this through the, the rest of my talk, but it's something I want to touch on. So DFO has this um, CSAS on FRIM. You know, I'm talk, working with the government now because I'm throwing out a bunch of acronyms. So DFO is Fisheries and Oceans Canada. FRIM is Fishing Related Incidental Mortality. And CSAS is the Canadian Science Advisor, Advisory Secretariat. And that's the official means that um, the science uh, department communicates findings to the management department. So I was involved in this review and it contains three pieces. These are all publicly available on the DFO website. And the whole point of the exercise was to consider fish experience. So it's using what we call the fish-centric approach. And it uses all available information for each species, and this is a salmon-focused review, um, to understand what's associated with fisheries-related incidental mortality, or FRIM. And that's research document A. Um, to estimate, and then using all that estimate to, um, to come up with a range of mortality estimates among a variety of scenarios for each species and fishery. And that's research document B. And both of those documents are quite lengthy. Um, so there is an official communication document available online as well. And I have some printed out here too, if someone would like one. But I just wanted to draw your attention that this review is out there. It's quite extensive. We put several years of work into it and it's all publicly available. And this framework that we used is the methods are applicable to all released fish, despite being very salmon centric. And essentially what the framework tends to do, uh, aims to do is look at fish response, it considers all the fishing factors like catch density, composition, crowding, the gear, the hand, uh, fishing gear, handling gear, recovery gear was used, all of which have an aspect of duration. It considers extrinsic factors such as water temperature, oxygen, etc. Intrinsic factors such as maturity, sex, age, size, um, pre-capture conditions such as injury. And then considers a variety of fate metrics. So is it acute mortality, latent mortality? Was the fish depredated upon release? And uses all that information to and scales all these factors to come up with a range of mortality estimates. 
So this human component that I evaluated with my research, this is important in any fishery and it's often overlooked. Um, handling is important and we need to account for co compliance with suggested best practices and also variability among vessels. And that's something that's rarely considered in, in scientific research. But pairing human dimensions research with collaborative experimental research by going out on, on boats, chartering them to do experimental fisheries um, does work towards this goal because at least is opening the dialogue of the collaborative research and making the fishing community aware of all the different ways you can handle fish and which ways may be better for, for their condition upon release. The semi-quantitative indices of injury and impairment, they're very easy and effective means to evaluate relative effects and estimate mortality. They are observation-based, so there is some subjectivity in there, but especially in fisheries in remote areas, it's a way to collect a lot of data and make relative comparisons. And then by coupling this with blood physiology where possible, you can look at divergence among the classifications to see how meaningful they are and look at potential mechanisms to try to understand why fish are dying. And these analytical methods, a few different ones I described, um, they're transferable to other to, uh, sorry, they're transferable to other systems, definitely. So the continuous blood sampling under various durations of stress or exposure that can be used with spline regression modeling to look at thresholds. This isn't always informative, that, as we saw with the air exposure model, though. So, um, but there's other models you can use, such as uh, the polar models, to look at probability classifications. And the strongest approach will use a variety of research and analytical methods and combine experimental research with social research and look at the whole picture and try to come up with um, recommendations from that. So that's all I have. Thanks for listening. And uh, I think I have some time for questions if, if people have questions. Great. Thanks very much, Katrina, for a really interesting seminar. Um, questions from the audience here? Thanks. Uh, I, there's certainly a lot of parallels to our problem here mm -hmm. with halibut, uh, although I, I, it seems like we may have a leg up in that our fish tend to survive at a much greater rate yeah. than most of these salmon. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering, looking at your early results on seeing what, 15 to 30 percent of these fish surviving all the way to their streams, mm -hmm. what would you expect the natural mortality rates to be over that same time period? Yeah, um, I'm asked that question a lot, and really we have no idea. I mean, there's no real way to estimate mortality without handling the fish and tagging the fish, and then you have tagging-induced mortality and capture mortality. Like, um, There has been some modeling done in river, and I don't really know, I need to read the paper again, how he came to the estimate, but um, the, the answer was 20% from this one paper. I don't know how relevant that is. I don't know if it applies to ocean conditions as well or marine environment, but I mean, that's our best guess, but we don't know. Sorry, maybe as one follow-up, what are the rates that the managers are actually using to assign mortality to these fisheries? It depends on the species and the fishery and the area and the gear type. There's a, a document that DFO publishes that has them listed out in that particular fishery. Um, it was initially 70% mortality, and um, after the study came out, they actually reduced it to 50% mortality. But the thing with the estimates that DFO uses is they only consider the first 24 hours as fishery-related incidental mortality, and anything beyond 24 hours isn't considered in management models. So my estimate from release to first detection took about four days on average, there's a lot of variability in there, and it was 70% or 70% survival, so 30% mortality. Um, so now they're using 50%. But I would say that's, that's a really big limitation of using mortality estimates like DFO does, is that they don't consider the latent effects and the long-term mortality. Um, I had a, a couple questions. On the tag data that you were using mm -hmm. that were going past the various kind of listening posts, was that just solely they report in or do you get any other information like what temperature environment the animal's in is the tag broadcasting anything or is it just simply hey the tag x passed this point at this point in time those tags i used were just tag x passed at this time stamp um, you can get acoustic tags with temperature data on them as well and depth profiles but um, they're a lot more expensive okay and i have two more one is on those percent survivals that made it 
mm -hmm. to their streams. Um, did you have any fat level readings on those that were predictive of their survival or no? I did try to record fat um, in that study. I didn't find it very informative. And I think, uh, I mean, we were talking about this earlier. I think a lot of it was due to user error. Um, we weren't really well trained on how to use the microwave energy meter and our readings were all over the place. And we actually stopped using it after a while because the boat was rocking. It was really hard to use. So I don't have much confidence in that data. Okay. And the last one we did touch on this morning, but um when you come up with a recommendation or a, an inflection point, like a 15 minute kind of exposure time sort of metric, did you have an average metric for sorting time when you're not there messing with fish that the fishermen know and they say, yeah, that's a realistic thing that we might be able to achieve or not? Or is it simply dependent on the size of the the catch? Like the it's dependent on catch. the size of the catch for sure. But the other thing is that I mean, the fishermen want to get through these sets as fast as possible and do another set. So it's in their best advantage to sort the fish as fast as possible. And they want all the tools and all the crew working towards getting the fish off the deck as soon as possible and doing another set. Um, so I think the 15 minutes is more, fishermen don't care about the 15 minutes. They want to do it as fast as possible. Um, so it's more informative in terms of management. If you are getting larger sets, you need to count for additional mortality if it's going to take longer than 15 minutes to sort of set. But I was going out on the boats during openings just as a volunteer observer, I would just go hang out. Um, and 15 minutes is definitely doable. Some sets are sorted within five minutes, but then it can take upwards of an hour with really large sets. But um, I'd say fisheries aren't really getting sets like that anymore. I, I think mostly openings are for medium sized sets that should be sorted within half an hour. Uh, thanks. Um, really good talk. Um, I was interested in um, if you noticed that if there was a difference in size of catch, um, let's say how many fish were brought in in the net, um, if there was a difference in cortisol levels or those types of things in the fish, depending on how much fit were brought, fish were brought on. Yeah, I included set size as a predictor in all of my models and it never came out as important, but set size was estimated by the skipper. Like we weren't able to count each individual fish. So I tried to get the, the skipper to estimate it, like the same person estimated every time, but he would just stand up in the wheelhouse and go, oh, 800. <laughs> and then I would write it down. <laughs> so I don't know how reliable that data is as well. So I would say that it's never come out as important, but I've also never really explored it to its full potential. Sorry, I had another one on the, on the the sorting topic. So they're wanting to get rid of them fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and this comes up with some of our EM work where there's times where getting those fish back into the water under a certain time, there's an incentive because there's a lower mortality associated with that. Mm -hmm. um, but you also don't want them grabbing the fish and just hucking them, yeah. by grabbing them anywhere and being less careful with them. So to the observation that the during your informational interviews on what they would see as a valuable thing. And one of the things was the shoot. You mm -hmm. didn't test the shoot as no. to a treatment, but did you have a perception that the shoot is in some manner uh, better than having it sorted on the deck or sorted on a table? And if so, how come? Yeah, definitely. Um, mostly because they're not having to hold the fish so much. And especially where scale loss is a concern, to release fish without a chute, you're having to bend over and physically pick up the fish and then huck it overboard. And sometimes you'll pick up the fish by the tail and just like, flip them overboard. And you know, the fishermen do tend to be, try to be as gentle as possible, but also trying to be as, as fast as possible. So with the sorting table, you can just braille them right on the table and then flip them overboard and not have to handle them. And it's easier on the crew as well. Um, where I did work on, on boats that had the chutes. The crew that had switched boats, they always talked about how much easier it was to have the chute and it was better on their back. Like chum are big. Imagine like picking up a hundred chum and like bending over and picking up a hundred chum a day rather than just being able to flip them over a chute. Um, it seems like a no brainer to me, but um, there isn't any funding to install these chutes or sorting tables. It's up to the fishermen themselves and there's a lot of animosity there and, and change is slow. So it, it hasn't been implemented yet. <laughs> 
Um, the yeah, one of the m most relevant injuries was the loss of scales and mm -hmm. and some of your um, iron data suggested that there might be a regulatory impairment of those mm -hmm. fish that would potentially affect their survivability. But um, is there any evidence, for instance, that that could also be related to um, a port of entry for pathogens and that disease could also play a role in, in the eventual mortal mortality yeah. of those fish? I didn't present any data, but I do have a chapter where I looked at severity of injury classifications and gene expression of inflammatory responses and antiviral responses and um, pathogen loads as well. And we do see some associations between pathogen loads and injury uh, in the days following release. It wasn't super clear because the other thing about marine caught chum is that they're relatively speaking compared to other species of salmon caught in the ocean. They're very clean. They don't have very many diseases. So it's a tricky data set to work with. But you do see with injury this clear down regulation of the antiviral responses and an upregulation of inflammatory response genes. So their immune system is being impacted and um, there were some associations with pathogens but they were quite weak just because of the, the loads were low in these fish. But And then in freshwater, not so much with scale loss but with open wounds, we do see associations between pathogens and injury. But in the marine environment, those relationships are harder to tease about uh, apart because we we don't know as much about marine pathogens in wild fish. The I have one last question. The um, the holding studies that you described. Uh, what are the, what were the containment facilities that you used? Was the, were those on tanks or or fish um, put in a larger pen? Yeah, so with the coho, I did onboard holding studies where the actual hold of the boat was was lined with netting and I held fish in there. I wasn't as happy with that because the holding conditions varied um, with sea conditions. Like when you got a big roll, then the fish were getting entangled in the net and it was clearly just not a very controlled environment. So in subsequent years, I moved to these net pens that I just attached to a fixed structure and floated and transported the fish to the net pens. Um, tanks would be a better way to do it, but it's just how do you how do you get the tanks out there and have appropriate water circulation and everything. So the open nets were the best way to do that. Any other questions? No? Well, then thanks very much, Katrina. Yeah, thanks for having me. Very interesting seminar. Thanks.